Hey, good Monday to you guys. Good to see you. Good to be seen. And remember, we're the hand that writes and quickly moves away. Hey guys doing? How was your weekend? I hope everybody had a good one. Mine was uh, quiet. Nice and quiet. And just a quick mention about this. Uh, you know, we like to focus on positivity around here, but we also like to, you know, remember the folks who are in need. So, uh, for any of our folks along the Gulf Coast, we hope you're safe and sound and dry where there's power. And I know you've probably got a lot of stuff going on, so don't, um, you know, don't don't waste ba battery power watching my live stream uh, if you're currently without electricity. Uh, let's see. Right off the bat, Adam Black with his hand up asking question. Yes, Mr. Black. A question I've always had about that Americal pick. Judging by the texture on the horse, is that a real horse or a magic horse? I've always assumed the latter, but that's just me. I never thought it was anything but a real horse. Um, Dave Trampier worked largely in pen and ink, but he had this unique style whereby, and if you look at some of his other smaller pictures, it's more evident. He could make things look like woodblock prints or woodcut prints um, through use of, of extremely bold, heavy strokes of black ink. Um, and you may just be seeing the effect of shading where he was thinking, okay, if I was carving this onto the surface of a wooden block, how would I shade it? How would I give it some coloration beyond just being a horse shape in the middle of the page with a few details on it? Um, I mean, hey, look, the Amiracall, the chaotic picture has inspired so many people over the 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 years um if in your mind's eye americal's riding on some some kind of magically summoned steed then go for it i don't think tramp's intention with the picture was to imply anything but um a, a kind of uh, you know just a kind of an action scene whereby you know there's a guy riding around throwing magical bolts sorry very thirsty today but if it works for you then absolutely do that Bo, hey Chris, hey Chris. Good to see you guys. But yeah, if that's uh if that's what you want to go with, if Americal is writing, you know something magical, then do it. It's A D and D, man. It's your game. Do it and enjoy it. But um, a few announcements about the show this week. Uh, we have a guest on Friday. Finally, finally, finally getting uh, Rusty Schaefer. Rusty's going to be on. We're going to just goof off and hang out and have a good time. Uh, I've known Russ now for about... oh. 15 years, 14 years, something like that. Um, he is uh, a good guy, a good gamer. He's working on some tools. I don't know how much he's going to have to talk about on Friday, but he's working on some tools for uh, Fantasy Grounds, which is a virtual tabletop. If that's your jam, um, then you can absolutely stop by listen to Russ talk about that if that's what he wants to talk about uh, we're going to take a few minutes and make detect plants a useful druid spell we decided we would do that so that's the thing that's going to happen Chris says Americall is one of Tramp's best yes it is 
and Miracle is definitely one of Dave Trampier's best pieces of works. Uh, I wish that Dave were still with us. I know, I have been told, I shouldn't say I know, I have been told that he was definitely warming up to the idea of returning to uh, illustration and tabletop game illustration before he passed away. Um, so, you know. Um, I have heard that he was rather embittered about losing Wormy to TSR. He sought to buy it back. But, you know, that's just one of those things we'll never know. But yes, uh, Trampier's artwork was probably the best of first edition. Detect plants useful? Sounds like quite a... We're going to try, Awig. We're going to try. Um, you know, Russ has got a keen mind. He's a database guy at, at his company. Uh, uh, CTO over there, so... You know we're we're gonna see what he can what he can do. So that's what's gonna happen on Friday. Tomorrow, of course, we've got um, game wrap up because tonight's AD and D night. Woohoo! Love me some AD and D. Um, so I'll wrap that up for you guys. And on that subject. I don't know if any of you guys uh, read the R A D and D subreddit. Um, Avina getting off Reddit. Reddit is worse than Facebook in terms of censorious behavior and being in the pocket of foreign governments. So I may be done with Reddit. I haven't decided yet. Um, so if that's where you're getting like the reads, the text reads of my post game wrap ups. They may not be there anymore. They just may not. Um, but that's a discussion for another time. All right. With all that nonsense aside, let's dive into it today. I honestly don't remember what it was that I said that I was going to do on Monday last week, so I apologize for that. I could not find my notes <laughs> and I was completely bum fuzzled but I said you know what we're going to talk about cities we're going to talk about cities and city adventures because we've talked about the country now let's talk about the cities ears itching today for some reason um I am an awful urban planner when it comes to AD&D cities um I don't have a good mind's eye for ta how towns are supposed to be laid out. Um, my Google history, Google search history is rife with map of city of Greyhawk, map of Verbabank, map of Stoink. Did anybody make a map of? I'm just terrible at it. Which is why my Greyhawk tends to be a howling wilderness, although I should really fix that. With very, very, very few towns and hamlets. Um, even in countries, even in well-protected and what would ostensibly be patrolled areas, there's just nothing. Don't be like me. Don't do that. Um... There is a set of geomorphs for walled cities available out there. If you know where to look and you can find it. TSR very briefly published their walled cities. They weren't nearly as popular as dungeon geomorphs. Um, probably not helped by the fact that the... Um, you know, the, the dungeons in D&D are done in non-repro blue. These were done in, like, non-repro peach. They're, like, a peachish brownish color, like, orangey brown. Um, which, if you watch Technology Connections, you'll find out that they're actually the same shade. 
but that's for another time. Um, but they they were very very briefly published. However, for talentless hacks like me who can't design city maps to save their lives. I can barely make good dungeon maps uh, from scratch. City maps are just a non-starter. I go and I find maps of ancient cities and use online generators whenever I can to create my cities. Um, I'm just not any good at it. But once you have your city cartographized, whether you use the the dungeon or the 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 walled city geomorphs, outdoor geomorphs, walled cities, or you use, you know, you can actually design cities and towns, um, or however you scavenge the maps. And I was telling uh, Alan Hammock this when he was on the show, um, Suderham in A3, Assault on the Area of the Slave Lords, is one of the few city-slash-town adventures in AD&D. Um, there's Hamlet, there's Suderham, and I mean strictly published for AD&D. Um, and that's all I can think of. That's, that's literally the only intact operating town maps that I can think of. So Suderham has been a lot of places in my D&T world. Um, so however you find your D&D maps, you know, the wilderness, you can or can't encounter things in the wilderness. Things that might or might not be in their lair. A city, even a good-sized town. Now, a village only needs be populated by a few interesting NPCs. You know, it's not like um, like a Bethesda game, you know, an Elder Scrolls or Fallout game where literally everybody in the town has something going on in their lives that your characters need to interact with. And that's not to say you don't need to make the NPCs in the town interesting, where it's like, again, to go back on the Bethesda thing, I've been playing Fallout 3 a lot uh, this past weekend, so, um, where, you know, you walk up to somebody and try to talk to them and they say, I don't have time for you, and then they just walk on. If the characters are trying to interact with everybody in a city or town that they meet, then it's up to you, the DM, to decide how tractable they are or are not. But in your city, which, you know, in a proper world, I could have maybe led the video in with the eagles uh, in the city, but, but hey, I got good music anyway. Bards of Greyhawk, check them out. Um, in a city or a good-sized town, you're going to have people that you bump into. It's inevitable. You just, you know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting somebody in a city. And if you get caught swinging a dead cat, you might get burned at the stake for witchcraft. But there is this awesome city town encounters section in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the flavor it brings. And then we're going to talk about the urban dungeon to steal a phrase from my buddy Lance Hovermail. The city is dungeon. Um, so we are all the way on page 190 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. If you want to zip over there. Um, the prime city or city slash town or towns in a campaign will usually have predetermined denizens and many encounters will be set according to facts thus developed. So right there, it shouldn't just be random encounters in a city or town. Have an idea of how the town is organized. And we'll hook our peepers over on um, 
types of governments and types of cities and so on. But generally speaking, you know, you're going to have maybe a council of syndics or a king or a lord or a prince or a castellan or someone is going to be in charge of the town or city in question. And to that end, there'll be effectively a fixed encounter. And there will be prominent people who have sought to align themselves with the powers that be in the city. Everybody is a social climber. And the only way up off the bottom rungs of society in a, in a pseudo medieval setting, unless you're just of the mind that the lower classes accept their lot, is to ingratiate themselves to people higher up the ladder as they go to get money, to climb the ladder further, lather, rinse, repeat, until they're invited to, to government functions. First you get to money, then you get to women. Then you get to women, then you get to power. Um, to quote Tony Montoya. So, messaging me. Anyway. So, um, to consider the, the town and city, you should definitely have a backbone of fixed stuff. Shops and shopkeepers. If this is a place where characters are going to call home or base themselves out of, at least for the duration of an adventure, shops and shopkeepers, knowing where they are and what they're doing is, is very important. Um, things like that, you know, what a store has in stock, all those are things you're going to want to set up. Um, Gary goes on, all sections of these prime inhabited areas will not be matrixed and all other town cities will basically be undeveloped. For all such areas, the city slash town encounter matrix is useful and boy, is it. Now, you don't just roll randomly for stuff, you know, people aren't just falling over 400 were rats when they're five feet away from the mayor's house. Or maybe they are. Maybe you roll like that. I don't know. But generally speaking, um, all encounters must be in their appropriate areas. A ghost will not be encountered in the main square of a city, rats in a palace, etc. I would debate that second one. If the role indicates an improbable encounter, just ignore it, and no encounter has taken place. Check for encounters every three turns as normally or otherwise as desired. And what Gary's suggesting you do there is to roll a d6, and on a, on a one, you have an encounter. Disguise all encounters by using vagueness and similarity. So I was mentioning weir rats. You shouldn't say, you know, they're stooped, semi-human, uh, semi-rat creatures you know with fangs and drool dripping from their mouths and and short swords in hand sort of creeping around no just say you know they're they're workmen they're beggars they're travelers they're not going to reveal themselves until it's too late for the party that is so that's what he's saying by disguise all encounters uh by using vagueness and similarity so i'm going to scroll over and there's encounters for different times of day or night. Now, it's the same stuff, just different frequencies. And some of them you note here, we're on page 191, left-hand column. Um, some of them you note are marked by asterisks. And what that's basically indicating is, check to see if the race is human or demi-human. And then there's, down here, uh, dwarven, elvish, gnomish, half-elven, uh, half-orc, halfling, and then human. human. Once again, humans, 31 to 100, way more common than anybody else. But if you look here, you've got daytime and nighttime, and the results are um, assassin, bandit, beggar, brigand, city guard, city official, city watchman, cleric, Demon or Nike demon, devil or mesodemon. Now, 
If we grab the monster manual, you'll note that Nicodemon and Mesodemon are not listed in there. They are types of demons that only show up in, uh, I believe it's D3 and Q1. Also, they're uh, in the Fiend Folio. So, if you had, say, the Just the Dungeon Master's Guide and Monster Manual and a Player's Handbook, that might have thrown you. But right there, and you don't run into them in the daytime at all, but right there, you start to see some of the real fantastical weirdness. You can bump into a devil or a demon on the street of a major city. There's a possibility. There's a chance. There's a 1 in 100 chance. That's a 1 in 50 chance because 23 and 24 of encountering a major, major, horrible, evil creature. But again, if it's in your city, make it on a mission. Don't just have it hanging out waiting to ambush people. It's not going to do that. That's a waste of its time. That's an adventure hook unto its own. There is a great possibility there for having an adventure. Um, so don't... Don't fall down on that. If you get the city encounter, then you... Uh, uh, or, I'm sorry, if you get, get a, a demonic encounter like that, you absolutely positively should... Make it something special. And there's some other stuff, too, we'll, we'll look at in just a minute. <laughs> Hello, Kevin, over on Facebook. I see you there. Mom always said the Fiend Folio is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, the Fiend Folio is like a box of chocolates, except 8 out of 10 of the chocolates have been replaced with balls of dried Play-Doh. Sorry, that's just how I feel about the Fiend Folio. Maybe the demon is a tourist looking for a good restaurant. Maybe. Just yesterday we had a vampire encounter in a game. Seduced one of the characters fair and square without using any special abilities. The players even joked about the lady being a vampire. A werewolf in London. There you go. You guys have got it. You're getting it. Uh-oh. Smooth streaming is not is not uh, possible right now, according to YouTube. So let's go on. Doppelgangers. You know, you got the old meme with uh, um, Donald Sutherland at the end of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But yeah, you know, that person you bump into at night who's stepping out of an alley looking pensive. Maybe just murdered somebody, dragged him in there, it took their face and is now doing their skinwalking best to, to motor around the city looking for other lives to steal. A druid. A drunk. Now, you're more often to run into a drunk at night, obviously, than you are during the day. But it's entirely possible. I would almost put the drunk under, like, drunken character type or it may just be a, a a normal drunk it could be somebody you're looking to roll but remember under intoxication drunk is braver and has more hit points he's harder to beat up just keep that in mind uh for your player characters a gentleman ghast or ghoul Doing a little impersonation of uh, the uh, the thriller video there. Ghost. I love that one because ghosts are horrible. Giant rats. Again, they could be in a castle. Maybe not running around the 
throne room. A good wife, harlot, and yes, we'll talk about that table. Illusionist, laborer or peddler, magic user, mercenary, merchant, monk, bard, night hag, noble, paladin, pilgrim, press gang, rake, rakshasha, ranger or ruffian, shadow, specter, thief. See, shadows and specters. Cities at night in D&D world are dangerous. A specter roaming the streets, roaming the foggy streets of your ancient London-sized city. That's If you're not putting that in there, you're playing D&D wrong, at least given the chance of, of it happening. Thieves. Thieves should abound in any major city. Always have your characters under risk of having their pockets picked. Tradesmen, wear rats, wear tigers, wear wolf, white, will o' the wisp, wraith, vampire, or lich. A lich! A lich just roaming around a city. It's rare, but it could happen. Oh, and there's a note there. Ruffians. If desired, one in four can be half-orc or of humanoid race. Goblin, hobgoblin, cobalt, orc. That's right. You can have kobolds roaming around your city at night. Or during the day. If you want. So it explains some of the, the encounter types. And let's look at that. Because these are great adventure hooks. These are awesome adventure hooks. We'll pause before we dive into that. Ah, the infamous... Yes. Oh, gosh. Um, so, Parker Chocolates. I would say more Russell Stover, but yeah. Kind of like that. Uh, Fiend Folio Monster Manual 2 are about 80% full of useless nonsense. I kind of got to agree with you there. I literally, Modrons are stupid and should never have been put in D&D. I know Gary was having a bit of fanciful, like, hey, what would be a totally neutral being? But I, it's just Modrons. I, I don't like them. I remember the first time I read through the City Encounter Tables. Wasn't that a rush? I remember it too. I was like, a city is more dangerous than a low or mid-level dungeon. It is. It really is. So it's nice about old D&D forces the DM to world build around how there could be a specter in the city. Exactly. Gary's doing like 70% of your homework for you right here. And once you start to explore it, it becomes interesting. <laughs> I've got a dozen problems, but a legit one. Very funny, Mr. Kulin. All right. So let's let's break it down. Let's look at these encounters here. Assassin encounters are dependent upon the locale. Normally, one to three assassins will be encountered, but near the thief's quarter, the encounter could be with many assassins at the guild, for instance. Assassins will typically ignore passersby or act as thieves, but are as likely to slay first and steal afterwards as to simply pick a pocket or two. So a group of assassins, and if you consider the role of the assassin, the, you know, they might have no truck at all with the characters, just we're here to do a thing, or we're hanging out. Maybe act as thieves, because they want to keep those trades sharp as well. But if push comes to shove, and weapons get drawn... Yeah. Bandits. Encounters in daylight hours will simply be a case of a nondescript group being seen. The bandits will perhaps be watching the encountered party as a future prospect. Nighttime encounters will typically be with 3 to 12 bandits with one or more leaders. That's something I should point out here. Don't use the monster manual encounters. Um, 300 bandits 
<laughs> Encountering them in, a, in the middle of a city would be a bit startling. <laughs> they would be the city. Go away, I'll call the Brute Squad. I'm on the Brute Squad. You are the Brute Squad. Um... There's a chance that a beggar will be a thief. Gary doesn't really give us a chance. That's up to you. There's a slight chance, 1% to 8%, they'll know some information of interest to the character. Um, and I've done this to my players, by the way, and you should too. Any gratuity or gift to a beggar will immediately attract the attention of other beggars nearby. Zero to nine others will be near so you you know you roll a d10 and you know one to nine ten is none brigands same as bandits um city guard is interesting i mean how many times have you had your players say oh we're having a bar fight the gendarme should absolutely show up to put a stop to that shit all right Nobody wants to get hit with some randomly flung spell or shot magical arrow. And no patron wants his, uh, his or her favorite watering hole destroyed because, you know, the, the hippie looking guy turned into a bear. Um, the dude in the blue robes suddenly caused uh, uh, eight hobgoblins to appear in the middle of the bar. And... The guy in, who walks around on plate mail all the time has a magic sword that's on fire. Nobody wants that. So city guard will definitely be ready. Um, the guard party will always be accompanied by a magic user, first to fourth level, who's endangered for one year of service, uh, one for year for some service rendered to him or her by the city, which was not repayable in some other manner. Bad debts, resurrection, infraction of city rules, non-payment of taxes, etc. That, by the way, should hook you back into, like, you know, you you've got a player who wants to be raised from the dead or you know, something like that. Well, maybe the city will pay for it. Here's how they get paid back. City officials. Um, again, uh, and you've got two to eight city guards with them. Um, they'll resent unwarranted intrusion, but they'll speak with persons regarding important matters. They will have one to four fighters as personal guards, D4 to determine individual level. So two to eight city guards and a bunch of first to fourth level fighters accompanying them. So if your party tends towards the steal first, ask questions later, the city official is not a good target for that. Or maybe they are. Maybe you want to teach your players a little bit of lesson. lesson. They're going to reach out and touch the stove. They're going to get their pities burned. Cleric encounters. 6th um, to 11th level. There will be 0 uh, through 5 lesser clerics with a major character. Alignments can be rolled for or dictated by area or race. Probably not going to have a chaotic evil cleric in, say, you know... Winter Shivan in, in the Theocracy of the Pale. So you should definitely adjust accordingly. A week says Planescape had worse true neutral outsiders for Tui. Never, never looked. I know people absolutely think planescape is cast from pure platinum and that's awesome that's great i've never even looked at planescape i know there was a planescape 2 torment video game that people just gushed over for the pc and people seem to like all the stuff that came out for it for 2e i never i'm not saying it's bad i'm not saying i never looked at that i just i, I never have <clears throat> My character was born here in the city with this... Ah, I see what you did. 
Calstaff, cities have to be more dangerous than a dungeon because the party has ready access to resources they don't have in a dungeon setting. Absolutely right. <laughs> Passerby says, hey, I won't be ignored, you cretin. Is that directed at me? Let me just put my thumb over it. There. I can ignore you. Got my thumb over your uh, your uh, message on the screen. Ha ha. Besides, you're just a passerby. Okay, now. Uh, so that's clerics. Your party can bump into an 11th level cleric. If they're good, it can lead to very good things. So you see the world building happening here. Um, demon or devil encounters must be carefully restricted and they may be ignored entirely if desirable. For example, near an evil temple, uh, there may well be a demon or devil. A succubus, a, a, a succubus may be roaming at night. A wizard may have conjured a demon, etc. Treat these encounters as highly special. Only one demon or devil will be encountered. I'm not being crass. I could definitely see a succubus showing up in a major city to ply her her particular uh, skill set to to get a free meal, as it were. You know, polymorph herself as a normal looking uh, but irresistibly attractive woman and then work that table, which we'll get to. Doppelgangers normally take place only near deserted places where there are entrances to the underworld, ruins, and the like. The number of doppelgangers will be three to six. Again, I think you can take doppelgangers and sprinkle them out in the general population. There's a very funny Oglaf strip. Um, you know, Sire the Shapeshifters are growing bolder every day. In fact, there's one of them within the castle right now. Fuck. Um, druids, again, like clerics, they generally shun conversation with the encountering party. And I don't think you would tend to run into druids in major cities. I would maybe save the druid encounters for smaller towns, which even then they might be loath to be in. Unless there's a large green space inside drunk encounters are one to four tipsy revelers or wine sodden bums 50 percent chance for either either um in the former case the type of characters found drunk should be diced for so there we go you can go back and look at all the possible drunk types and I might even trim a couple of those down and add Harlot in there also. Um, women can get drunk too. But character types, assassins, bandits, brigands, city guards, officials, watchmen, clerics, druids, fighters. Um, and, and the list just goes on. So there's a whole subtable there of beings that you can run into who are drunk. When an encounter with a drunk occurs, the reaction for the latter will dictate what is said to the party. The drunk characters will become sober on a roll of 10% or less out of 100 if threatened. Check each uh, turn for... Uh, or, uh, check each turn or melee round. See effects of alcohol and drugs in the damage subsection of combat. Even Gary's telling you there. Uh, fighters, 6th to 12th level, accompanied by 0 to 3 henchmen. Gentlemen are encounters with a foppish dandy and sick of 1 to 4 sycophants, 40% uh, of the time. A gentlewoman, 20% of the time. And 40% of the time with some well-dressed fighter types of 7th to 10th level, with 1 to 4 friends of same abilities. Any rude remarks will give offense, of course. Fops will seek revenge by causing trouble for the party with official. Gentlewomen will send a champion. Fighters will challenge the offenders. Again, we're building a world right here. You should be using this table to build your bear cities. So, take a geomorphic town. And again, I, just like with outdoor encounters, I would recommend you roll on this table chart before the party adventures in the city and just check each 
section of the city that they might possibly traverse through. Note how often or note how fast that they are or are not going to be traveling. And something that Gary doesn't say here, this is a, this is a best practices, this is a, a Bill's advice to you. Every time, every time the characters exit a building, if they've spent at least three turns or 30 minutes in there, and definitely if they went in in day and came out at night, check the tables. Absolutely check the table and see what might be walking by, if anything, right then. Uh, gas and uh, encounters must be near charnel houses, graveyards, and the like. The number encounter will be two to eight. Your huge city of Greyhawk size city definitely has undead in it. Just recognize that that is a thing. They are there. Check for that. Ghosts are treated in a similar fashion to gas, but of course, a locale or two can be haunted. One ghost will be encountered. You should absolutely have a haunted house. Somewhere in your city, there should be a shunned house. Maybe it's on a hill overlooking the graveyard. Maybe it's a ramshackle building where, you know, the whole family was murdered one night. and Nobody wants to move in and occupy the place. And the town guard has boarded up the place, but there's rumored to be fabulous wealth inside or something like that. You should absolutely have a haunted house someplace in your city. Uh, ghouls is gassed except in numbers. Giant rats. Um, giant rats should be everywhere in major, again, Greyhawk-sized cities or or Verbabonk-sized cities or even Stoink-sized cities. They should be encountered everywhere. Um A good wife, a good wife is essentially um, an, uh, an upper middle class noblewoman. Um, so let's see. So let's talk about that table, the harlot table. This gets a lot of grief from people who think, well, we have proof right here. Gary Gygax was a misogynist, which is a lie, but when you consider the influences of literary things on AD&D. &D. Certainly, Tolkien didn't have streetwalkers in Gondor. Maybe he did, and he just didn't tell us. But let's, let's talk about the table. Harlot encounters can be with brazen strumpets or hardy courtesans, thus making it difficult for the party to distinguish each encounter for what it is. In fact, the encounter could be with a dancer only prostituting herself as it pleases her, an elderly madam, or even a pimp. In addition to offering of the usual fare, the harlot is 30% likely to know valuable information, 15% likely to make something up in order to gain a reward, and 20% likely to be or work with a thief. You may find it useful, not you have to, you may find it useful to use the subtable below to see which sort of harlot encounter takes place. Slovenly troll, you know, this is your woman who cares little for appearance. She's all about the act. Um, a brazen strumpet. Uh, she's not afraid of the city watch. Cheap trollop, typical streetwalker, saucy tart, wanton wench. I'm just going to leave it to you guys to figure out this. You have dictionaries. You can look this up. Expensive doxy. Haughty courtesan. Aged madam. Wealthy procuress. Sly pimp or rich panderer. 
An expensive doxy will resemble a gentlewoman, a hardy courtesan, a noblewoman, and the other harlots might be mistaken for good wives, and so forth. So there, I talked about the wandering prostitute table. Illusionists, and you've got leveled encounters with illusionists, laborers, three to twelve nondescript persons loitering or on their way to or from work. Uh, they will be rough customers in a brawl. There's a 10% chance for each to be a levy in the city watch with consummate commensurate friends and knowledge. So if your party is into beating up longshoremen, there's a chance it can bring a world of hurt down on them. Magic users, again, 7th to 12th level. And henchmen. Mercenaries. This can be a good one if your party's looking to hire and these guys aren't working for anyone. Uh, merchants. One to three purveyors or factors in the daytime, but at night, two to eight mercenary guards with the merchants if the encounter is in a dangerous sector. Guards will be zero level with one leader of first to fourth level. A merchant will fear robbery, but is 10% likely to have useful knowledge for a price. 10% of merchants encounter will be rich, thus indistinguishable from an important city official or noble. Monks, night hags. Treated similar to demon and devils, i.e. the area must suit the encounter. One to two night hags will be encountered. Nobles with noblemen and noble women, they have guards and retainers. Paladins. Uh, a paladin of 6th to ninth level. Note, there's no retainers. They're just indistinguishable from fighters. Um, pilgrims, check out the monster manual for how pilgrims are. Uh, press gang. Guess what? You're going to come work on the ship with us. These guys can be dangerous to first level party, but they can kick off an adventure. It's 2 to 16 burly sailors or soldiers armed with swords but wielding clubs. Gang members will be first level with one leader of level 2 to 5. Outnumbered or incapacitated characters may be shanghaied into the local navy or militia. Rake. Encounters are with 2 to 5 young gentlemen fighters of 5th through 10th level. They will be aggressive, rude, and sarcastic. Rakshasha. Similar as demon or devils. I could see a Rakshasha. Now, this, I could see a Rakshasha infiltrating into a city and just having a fine old time climbing the social ladder. One to three will be encountered. Rangers, again, no retainers for Rangers. Uh, ruffians can have an assassin amongst them. There's a 5% chance. Per ruffian encounter that an assassin of 5th to 8th level, D4 plus 4, will be with a group. All weapons will be concealed. Shadows. Treat them as demon of devils. Um, they'll be in deserted places. Specters. Same as a ghost. Thief. 8th uh, to 11th level thief with 0 to 2 apprentices of 1st to 4th level. If there is but one thief here, she will be... An adventurer merely stopping for a short time in the city of town. Other thieves encountered will be on guild business or working or both. Thief encounters are awesome. Pick your character's pockets at every turn. Are your characters in a crowded market square? Pick their pockets. Are your characters in a uh, busy tavern? Pick their pockets. Have their rooms broken into. Thieves in big cities should be the norm, not the exception. I'm going to stop here and take in a few questions. A wig says, play Torment, skip the tabletop. Seems like this is great for a metropolis like Greyhawk, but what about Hamlet? I guess the DM would have to make their own or no random encounters because it is a safe haven. Um, Hamlet's a quiet enough place that you're not necessarily going to have random folk that you just bump into particularly not this bunch even despite the proximity of the toe and the moat house now if you're if you're running village of homlet and your party could really fucks up um the mission to purge the moat house and deal with the temple 
you might consider some of the nastier encounters creeping in the place, particularly if they can suss out that the party was responsible for raids. That drunk is the devil. Uh, Chris says, I hated Planescape uh, from that two year. I enjoyed Spelljammer and Dark Sun. All right. The assassins that ignore random passers-by. Yeah, they, they can. I mean, it might draw unwanted attention. Uh, these encounters would not necessarily be combat-oriented. Yes, Gabor brings up a very, very valid point. Um, demon and devil encounters uh, are... Well, really, any encounters need not be combat-oriented. It, it doesn't have to be... A big brawl in the middle of the street go back to town guards um, you know an encounter except with the most inestimable evil creatures can be a friendly encounter maybe demons trying to trick the unwary into bargains or making adventures an offer that looks very good in the short term exactly if my mic isn't running through desktop audio, then you can turn desktop to monitor only in OBS. Uh, okay, I mean, is my audio not sounding good? Hey, wait, <laughs> rodents of unusual size. Yes, they don't exist. <clears throat> so you can be robbed by our pimp. Absolutely. I like the way Adam puts this. So for if you're listening over on Facebook or you're you're watching it later, um, the way he worded the harlot table, it all it seems like Gary was tired of immature pay players and tongue in cheeked uh, the whole thing. It, it always felt to me like a bonk go to horny jail me. Yeah, yeah, you know. It could. Oh, what kind of prostitute is she? Really. She's a slovenly troll. She's in a dirty dress. She hikes it up and shows you her private bits and asks for a copper. You know. You can hear my desktop now. Oh, 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 okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I've got surround speakers on my main rig over there. So, yeah. <laughs> it's picking that up. Sorry. Um, I think it would be picking it up even if I did just go to uh, desktop audio. Um, internet encounters always include a rake yes it was certainly a thing of the time see the women guidelines in JG's invisible over, invincible overlord I like invisible overlord better um, yeah I'm not watch as I lose subscribers for saying this I'm not a huge fan of JG's stuff i'm just not it just doesn't I, i'm not saying it's bad I, i'm just not crazy about it i mean it's like some people you know some people love pistachio ice cream i'm not saying it's it's bad i just don't care for it um rakshasha and vampire encounters make excellent npc but yes they do rakshasha and vampires should be running shit at an assassin's or thieves guild level or trying to to move in on those businesses <laughs> usually to pay extra for that <laughs> ir i'm gonna leave that one to you because i think i know what you're talking about thieves guild is local mafia yes absolutely uh a week says Ricardo was talking about some game that was about slave trading women that he saw when he was with the Frog Boys. I uh, yeah. <laughs> See, people say, "Oh, Bill, so you're a gamer?" Well, I play AD and D. Yeah, but you play other role playing games? Not so much. No. You know, when people bring me new things, they're like, "Have you seen this?" I'm like, "No," and I didn't want to. Wipe your feet before you come in here is my attitude. All right. <laughs> I wonder if the pe Gabber says, I wonder if the people who take the prostitute table dead seriously also take the cartoon with the adventures wearing Mickey Mouse ears dead seriously. It could be. You know, 
I notice an interesting dichotomy, and I'm going to get off on a little bit of a rant, and I don't want to spend too long because I want to wrap up the 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 table here. Um, there are people who will tell you you absolutely that like like if they come to play AD and D, they're like, oh, I want to play a gnome. Okay, cool. Yeah, you know, you you can you can play a gnome. Can my gnome have a helicopter backpack that he made that's like clockwork and steam powered? And he's got like double crossbows, and so he, and he and his name is Gunship, you know, but it's G H U N S H P S H I P P E, and you're like, no. Oh well, pff, you don't want to have fun. Fine, I'll do, you know. And they if they stick around, they resentfully play. But you can tell that they're not having a good time, um, or they constantly make jibes about the fact that you wouldn't let them run. Uh, you know, gunship, the uh, helicopter backpack wearing uh, twin automatic crossbow wielding gnome. Um, you know, because you don't like fun. But then you turn around and you're like, harlot table. And they turn into pearl clutching moralists. You know, or they see a bare breast in the monster manual. And they just freak out over this. It's like, you want to have stupid cartoony fun that's like on the level of of uh, Bugs Bunny, Wile E. Coyote. I want to have fun that's laughing at other things or poking fun at other things. But your fun is cool and my fun is not. So, <laughs> Death Copta with Big Shit. Yeah, that would go in 40K. That would absolutely go in 40K. <laughs> Chris says, I'm not unsubbing because of your take on Invisible Overlord. I'm unsubbing because of your uh, dislike of pistachio ice cream. You probably don't like Spumoni either. Well, no, I do like Spumoni. But anyway, Gabber hits the nail on the head when he, you know, says they take the the adventures wearing the Mickey Mouse ears dead seriously. So let's wrap it up. So we've got several weir types. Weir rats. Um, weir rats can be any type of human if, if desired. See Swords of Lankmar by Fritz Leiber. Um, weir rats should abound in a city, relatively speaking. They should be part of the Thieves Guild or working in cahoots with other evil beings in the town somehow. Um, where tigers are fun. They can be nice, you know, a bit savage, but, but nice. Um, werewolves, their wolves, their castle. Um, again, lycanthrope encounters in a city, uh, all day and 50% of the night, encounters will be with creatures in their human forms. Werewolves will generally be seeking prey, although there's a 20% chance they're on some special errand and ignore the encountered party. Um, I think with werewolves, if you do roll that 20% chance, um, their special errand is that they're looking for a place called Leho Fuchs. They want to get a big plate of beef chow mein. What? None of you Philistines like Warren Zevon? Oh. Anyway. Um, so we're rats. 90% uh, likely that they'll be in human form in the day. And night is 50% likely they'll be in human. 50% for giant rat form. Note, not in the in-between. Not in the humanoid rat form. Either giant rat or human. Which is not to say they couldn't turn into one into that shape from one of the other forms to do battle. I'm just pointing out, you're either going to see them as giant rats or giant humans. As a combat evolves, that may change. Uh, whites are like gas. Will-o'-the-wisps. Now, if you don't think will-o'-the-wisps are dangerous, yeah, a will-o'-the-wisp can and should potentially be a serial killer in a city. You know, we're finding dead trunks, dead prostitutes. They obviously died in some agony. They've got burns all over their bodies. 
Um, it's a will o' the wisp doing it. That could be a great adventure for the characters. And we come to it. Yes, I will zoom down. We're at one hundred eighty-five percent now. A miracle, the chaotic. Yeah, I just see the horse there as being um, illuminated from the dude that's dead and on fire on the ground in front of the green griffin. Um, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, this is an actual street in uh, Rhodes. Uh, so you can actually find the photograph of this. So let's see, 185, let's get back there. Race, the same as ghosts. Vampires are the same as ghosts, but the vampire ranges nearly anywhere in the city or town in human, bat, or gaseous form. They are always seeking new victims. And we get into stuff that they might have. Uh, all first level or higher characters in encountered in a city or town may possess one or more magic items on his or her person at the time of the encounter. Of course, as they will employ the item, this should be determined before interaction takes place between the party and the encountered. The power of the item must be commensurate with the level of the possessor. So... When you run into that encounter of Town Watch and they've got a second through fifth level magic user with them, consider these tables. You know, magic user. Chance per level. There's a 50% chance that a magic user is going to have some kind of protection device, a potion, or a scroll. Or a miscellaneous weapon, which for a magic user would be a dart, a staff, a club or a dagger. Um, monks have the least chance, of course, of having any magic items. Um, and then it, it kind of distributes in a weird way. But here are your magic protection, amulet of life protection, ring of protection, bracers of defense, cloak of displacement, cloak of protection, etc., 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 etc. Any... Uh, item generated must be appropriate to the character and usable any duplications are disregarded for example a magic user with a protection device a cloak of displacement for whom miscellaneous magic items is also determined cannot have another such cloak so you guys see you guys see um You really need to use these tables to stock up your dungeon adventures with, to spy, or stock up your city adventures with. You take a city like Greyhawk, all of this stuff's going to be common. There should be at least a vampire in there. Lich? Mm, I'll leave it up to you to decide. I tend to think of liches as being in all faraway places, not to be disturbed. There's two canonical Lich appearances in 1st edition AD&D. A Sararak, who's really a demi-Lich. And then Asperdes the First, who is a Lich who has a tomb in D2. Um, or maybe D1. It's one of the D modules. But as far as I'm aware, those are the only published Liches. And they're both very high level. So one just kind of knocking around a city. Don't necessarily agree with that. Lich's thing is long life and contemplation of black magic. Amen on the werewolf and Greyhawk. Um, let's see. Where did the idea of gnomes as mad scientists come from? Dragonlance? I hate that. Yeah, I have no idea. I, I, I don't really, you know. There are a few... I hate to say this term, because I, I, I don't like the term and I don't like the trope. Steampunk odds and ends that are in 1st edition AD&D. They are almost all artifacts, and they are all rare, and they are not cranked out in a 
fucking garage by a gnome with a penchant for screwdriver and and um, spanner use. Dragonlance made it worse if it didn't invent the trope. Yeah. Amen on the werewolf and yes. Uh, werewolves are on a werewolves. Ha ha ha. So that is a chance of running into Lon Chaney. Yes. Or Lon Chaney Jr. And they will be accompanied by a noble woman. <laughs> uh, the one e Lankmar City of Adventure has a lot of good resources for developing cities. The city geomorphs are extremely useful. I should seek to get that, you know? I really should see if I can lay my hands on a copy of it. His main detail... <laughs> Are you saying his hair is perfect, Adam? Uh, I'm telling you, magic horse. If it works for you, brother, go for it. Still looking for that anti-aging ring for my flintlock pistol. Um, okay. Anti-magic ring. Oh, I know what's... Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, you clever players. So the trope goes like this. A flintlock pistol, you know, you pull the hammer back, it's got a little striker pan, you gotta put the put the powder and the thing in. Magic user is cast um, shrink on a boulder that's been chiseled into perfect roundness. It's used as shot and around the end of the barrel of the gun is an anti-magic ring. So when the player pulls the trigger and the shot flies out, the rock turns into a boulder and flies over and crushes the opponent. Asperdes is in D1. He almost TPK'd a party of mine. Um, a single thief escaped. Yeah, I can believe it. I don't know where you can find it. Yeah. I don't remember if it's on Facebook or if it's on if if it's over in Dragon's Foot. Um a few years ago, Paul Stormberg, who is just a great guy, he's been a guest on the show a lot of times. I may have to get him on here to tell the story of the party dealing with Asperdes. Um But when they sussed out his lair they retreated back to the surface and spent a month in preparation for going after him. They had scrolls. They had, they created potions. They were using laser weapons and energy weapons that they had gotten in S3 expedition to the barrier peaks on this guy. And it was apparently an hours long fight against Asperdes just because of the spell firepower he had and his ability to nullify magics that the characters are bringing to the table. And yes, A-Wig, that's exactly what would happen. Bang! Poop! Clunk! Maybe even before then, just because it's in proximity to the ring. Cannonballs, not boulders. Yeah, it's cannonballs. That's what it was. So cannonballs a little more, you know, a li li little bit more, but still, that's that's ridiculous. So yeah, that you should absolutely use these tables to flesh out your city encounters. Um, Sorry. Um, you know, see, uh, Chris says, I can see a lich inhabiting a city. If it was its former tower and people still thought he was alive, just hold up like a hermit ish wizard. It would be very Lieber esque uh, adventure if used. There's. I'm trying to think of what. Fawford and Grey Mauser story it is, but they actually do uh, encounter a lich and destroy its phylactery. It's not named as such, 
neither things are given its name, but it is essentially exactly that. Um, the, uh, the, um, He, he's he's just an evil wizard that Fawford and Grey Mouse are end up fighting and are the description is like their swords are going through thin stone when they stab the guy and he is invulnerable and I is it Mouser I think Mouser finds the gems and destroys them and destroys his phylactery but all of these things guys all of these items on the list you absolutely need to use to populate your city now don't go over the top remember we i mean unless over the top suits you but out of the box if you're new to dungeon mastering first edition ad and d use these gently use them strictly as random encounters um you know every three turns let us say let us wrap up today with an example. We'll say 10 possible chances for an encounter. The characters spend, it's 10, uh, let's see, 10 possible chances is 30 turns. Uh, turn is 10 minutes, so that's, um, so six hours, six hours in a city, but let's, Let's dice up and see if we have any. Every three turns, it's going to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Nice fireballs worth of D6s here. Well, look at that. I've got one, two, three. And you might break it up and say, you know, the green one is the first encounter, the white one is the second one encounter, the the yellow one is the third encounter, and then you mentally space it out through the day. And let's go take a look at the table. What do they encounter? So we'll have two encounters in the day and one at night. Scroll back up here to our table. So our first day encounter, 67. I have a 67. Pilgrims. Religious pilgrims moving through the city. So we'd need to go over and consult the monster manual for them. And my next day encounter, or my next encounter during the day. So you don't have to stack all these together. Uh-oh, 100. What is 100 during the day? A werewolf. I'm not kidding. I rolled a double odd. So during the day, let's see, werewolf. Nope, it's over here. All right, two to five of them. Oh, there's five of them. All day and 50% of the night. The werewolves will generally be seeking prey. Although there's a 20% chance they're on a special errand and will ignore the encountered party. 93. They are not going to ignore the party. So they might set up an ambush for the party as they step down a quiet side street or alley. Or perhaps one of them will feign injury and try and summon the party to them. Perhaps that place is their lair. Let's check the monster manual and see how often they are in their lair. That's right. You can have city encounters in lair. Let's see. Lycanthrope. Let's see. So werewolves, 25%. So do they have some hideout in the city that this encounter has happened in? 
No, it is not in their hideout. This is just on the streets. So they won't even have any treasure. And there's five of them. And they're four hit dice apiece. And they surprise on a one, two, three. They'll wait for an opportune moment on an abandoned street to jump out and attack the party. But let's assume our party survives that encounter and nobody winds up uh, feeling a little hairy. What's our last encounter? 91. We're hitting the big ones. This is nighttime. This could be bad. 91. Where rats? This town is overrun. This town is overrun with uh, with lycanthropes. Kind of got off the target there. Nope, that's demons. All right. So these were rats are in human form. And there are two of them. They will intelligently try to set up ambush or otherwise react to an encountering party. Now, if it's a large party, large enough and powerful enough to stave off the, uh, the werewolves earlier, and they haven't been significantly weakened, you might look at this were-rat encounter and say, eh, they're not going to get involved in the party's shit. So keep that in mind. I guess they're not looking for Lee Ho Fuchs. Yeah, no kidding. Oh man, if I rolled for a city lich, you can bet that SOB would be trying to steal the souls of everyone in town somehow. Yes. Yes, that would be the case. So, so there's three possible encounters during the course of a day. Now, you may dice up. And again, you have to keep it... <laughs> go to no jail. You may have to keep it, um, specific for area encounters. Again, if your party is in the highest, noblest quarter of town, the, you know, you're, you're in, you know, uh, what is it uh, from Skyrim? Oh, do you get to the cloud district very often? <laughs> what am I saying? Of course you don't. Um... You know, if you're up in the cloud district, it may be that you want to ignore some of these checks. But once every 30 minutes, once every three turns, is a total of 48 checks. You as the DM, you might want to have a book of city encounters handy where you just, you just roll through that. And do one for each section of your city, ignoring obvious ones like, you know, we're in the rich merchant's quarters. Ghouls. Nope. Ignoring that. Reroll. Or just ignore the encounter entirely and call it no encounter. But you can do that. You can build an entire city book from these tables and then base it in your town. And change it up periodically. You know, you can have city encounters where, you know, the party encounters the werewolves and then they dispense with them. Um, and the town pays them handsomely. They end up staying there. But they're never going to bump into those again. But you may want to substitute in another encounter so that you don't just completely depopulate the entire town of any fun whatsoever all right beating up on bethesda software again but your town should not be full of solvable quests where we're done here and there's nothing but default dialogue to get from people you know i show up here periodically and trade off all my low-end potions for a little bit of gold but i go do my major adventuring in every city and town and etc your town should constantly, it should be alive. When the werewolves are dead, put something else in there. 
change it up periodically. But make yourself a nice notebook of possible creature encounters. It's the eyeball. Where rats could summon giant and normal rats to assist them in overbearing the party? Absolutely. The werewolves and were rats are in conflict. See, you guys are doing this. You guys are picking this up. So if you're a new DM, read read the chats here. Read the the, the chats. These are awesome ideas you guys are, are are hitting with. This is world building. This is world building 101. All of these are important things for your cities and your towns. I suck at city and town design. My cities and towns don't suck because I use what's in the Dungeon Master's Guide as a guideline, as a baseline. Um... I mean, you know, I'll grab a handful of D6s again. This represents, you know, there's an hour with two possible encounters in it. You know, I'm rolling 3, 6, 9, 12, 12 D6. And that only represents... A few possible encounters for the day. Let's see, 12d6 every 30... Yeah, this is six hours worth of... A cocked die. That's an encounter. So in 30 minutes... I've got five encounters in my city in 30 minutes, folks. Five encounters. And what are they? We'll say two during the day and three at night. 87. Tradesmen. 81. A thief. Nighttime, 64, a nobleman, 64. city guard, and finally, 67, a press gang. There's no reason your cities shouldn't live and breathe. Don't just... Uh, th there's... One of my favorite computer role-playing games... I may live stream playing this one day. I don't know. But it's... Um, it's... Uh, uh, Wizardry by Surtech. Wizardry has a city that's located literally on top of the dungeon. Which, if you know a bit of the lore of the game... Granted, we're talking about a game from 1978. To be fair. It was written for 16 kilobyte or maybe it was 24 kilobyte memory having Apple II computers. Later ported to other platforms. IBM PC, Commodore 64, Atari. Um, but the, um, the, the city is three places. It's the tavern where you assemble the party. It's the temple where you can have characters raised or cured of persistent diseases or poison that your clerics can't fix yet. And it's Boltax, a, uh, a um, armorer who sells the party their gear. That's it. Don't be like wizardry. Make living, breathing towns... Your characters may want to spend all their time in the city having adventures. They're like, hey, we're getting a big haul in here. You know, we're we're having fun adventuring in Greyhawk. And if they do, that's fine. It's up to you to make do with whatever else it is. But that's fine.
What is going on in the chat? <laughs> Awig says, Tokamata comes to take an eyeball into custody for questioning. Yeah, well, you're not going to stop him from doing that. You couldn't talk him out of anything. <laughs> oh, it cracked me up. I tell you, today's live stream is so much fun and I'm enjoying it so much that I really genuinely wish I could keep going all day on this, but I can't. Um, but when you're creating your AD&D game, use the Dungeon Master's Guide. This, when I talk about the, the DMG being the best book ever created for role-playing games, stuff like this is why. Not just because it's a, uh, not just because of random tables, but this specific random table will build a town or city's worth of encounters for you. Forty-eight checks for random encounters, forty-eight checks for an entire day, just one day's worth of adventures. And if the characters don't bump into things, I mean, there are some that can. There, there are some that can be ignored after the second day. But the prostitute, the, the prostitute is not going to be there forever. Um, the paladin might just be walking through town. You can adjust those things. But there are some that you can hit. The vampire, the specter, the demons, the, the lycanthropes. And even good things. Tradesmen and so on. Noblemen. You can build on those things and make your city live and breathe. So do that. Do that, guys, and you will make a fantastic campaign world for your characters that really pops. And it's not just going to be, you know, we go to the inn. We go, you know, there's a tavern in the bottom of the inn and uh, there's a temple where you can get healed up. That's it. Don't do that. Don't deny yourself as a dungeon master and don't deny your players as players good, exciting, colorful stuff. And this will color your worlds and how they're laid out. Just food for thought. So tomorrow we will wrap up, uh, post-game wrap up of the AD&D game. Wednesday, I don't know if Kyle's going to be able to join us Wednesday. I hope so. I'll find out from him tonight. And I'll mention in the Discord, if he doesn't, whether or not he's going to be able to be with us. I hope he will. I hope he'll, he will be here. Um, Thursday, more on the Dungeon Master's Guide. And Friday, Rusty Schaefer will be here talking to us about all kinds of stuff. It'll be a very laid-back guest visit. So... I want to thank everybody who showed up today. We had a good crowd today, yeah? I mean, learning the city stuff is pretty cool if you're new to it, right? So have a fantastic day. Please stay safe. Uh, if, if you're out there in Louisiana, I, I hope you're well. I hope everything's okay. Everything's okay. And you rode the storm out and did all right. So guys, have a wonderful, wonderful Monday. We'll see you tomorrow. And for the rest of the week, take care of yourselves. And oh, by the way, before I forget, I got to do my mention of it. Bards of Greyhawk, give them a listen. They made the theme music for the show. I'm working on a bumper for it. So you guys have a little something to listen and want, listen to and watch. Um, but the track that the guys at Bards of Greyhawk made for the show is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, that's... Um, Uh, sorry. Let's see. That's uh, Jeremy Barber. That's uh, Rich Lopez. Our Bards of Greyhawk. Um, they're an AD and D themed band. So how could you go wrong? And they made a beautiful piece of music for the show. I'll play that for you tomorrow. Um, but anyway, you guys have a fantastic day. I love you all. Thank you for stopping by. We're at 765 subs, by the way. Get more subs. More subs equals con. That's right. More subs equals gaming convention. 
So do that. And I will talk to you guys later. Peace.